there has been a long debate in this country about who we are as a people. It was present at the founding. It is present at today. There are roughly two views. Professor Stephen Smith of the University of San Diego School of Law discusses the two views of the nation. He calls one the providentialists and the other the secularists. He writes, providentialists declare that God works in history, that it is important as a people to acknowledge this providential superintendence and that the community should actively instill such beliefs in children as a basis for civic virtue. Secularists, on the other hand, insist that acknowledgments of deity, if there is one, ought to be purely private, and that government acts improperly if it enters into religion or expresses or endorses religious belief. Thus, what one constituency views as imperative, the other regards as forbidden. Many others have recognized these two strains in America's view of itself. In his book, Divided by God, Noah Feldman of the Harvard Law School describes one as values evangelicals and the other as legal secularists. James Davison Hunter, who wrote the influential book, Culture Wars, The Struggle to Define America, referred to the two camps as orthodox and the other as progressive. The orthodox camp is defined, as he says, by the commitment on the part of adherence to an external and definable and transcendent authority that tells us what is good, what is true, and how we should live and who we are. Hunter argues that the progressives, even the religious ones, place their trust in personal experience or scientific rationality. These two views naturally play out in different ways in the political and policy arena, but importantly, they inform their adherence, their adherence understanding of who we are as a nation. Are we a religious nation or are we a secular nation? The problem is acute because while incompatible beliefs that are purely abstract can be maintained by individuals, the physical world that we live in inevitably requires some specific answers to this question, whether in the expressed public statements of our leaders, the ceremonies we carry out, the words on our money, our national motto, and even and perhaps especially in what and how we teach our children. Since we have tried as a people to avoid making an explicit commitment to one worldview in the form of an established state church, and because disparate views find warrant in our history and our founding documents, there has been a competition in our society from the beginning as to which viewpoint will dominate. At various times, the providentialists have had the upper hand, and at other times, the seculars have dominated. Professor Smith calls this the principle of open contestation and explains that the competition has been similar to the competition between the political parties. Sometimes the Democrats win, sometimes the Republicans win, but the federal government has tried to avoid explicitly taking a side until 1947, which is when the Supreme Court decided a case called Everson v. Board, which applied the Establishment Clause to the states rather than just to the federal government, and explicitly excluded religion from a part of the public square. It was then that the federal government began to disturb the delicate balance that American society had historically maintained. After the Supreme Court unbalanced the competition between the providentialists and the secularists, the court began to promulgate, according to its own sense, the proper role or lack thereof of religion and society. In the 1962 school prayer decision, Engel v. Vitale, the Supreme Court rushed the field and took the side of the secularists. Engel v. Vitale ban banning prayer in school, it's an interesting case because uh, prayer in school was not was not universal in this country, though it was universally accepted. It was mostly practiced in the East and in the South. And some parents in New York State objected to a rather anodyne prayer, Father in heaven, please cast your blessings upon our country, our leaders, our teachers, our parents, and ourselves. That was it. It was, it was written by a, a Catholic priest, a, a Protestant minister, and, and a Jewish rabbi who walked into a bar. So 11 out of 13 judges heard this, 13 judges heard this case and 11 of them supported prayer in school, including ones who did not particularly care for prayer in school, but they saw it as constitutional. Um, Engel was followed almost immediately by something called Abington v. Shemp, in which the court ordered that Bible reading in school was unconstitutional. The court said that the government must be neutral in matters of religion, and the only way that the government could be neutral in matters of religion was to limit uh, federal action, uh, 
was limited to actions serving secular purposes and having primarily secular effects. This was the federal government putting its thumb squarely on the scale against religion. After all, secular has come to mean without religion and without God. Now what followed? Almost immediately, a bunch of court cases that I argue has established a state church. 1965, Griswold making, uh, uh, striking down all laws on, on contraception for married couples. 1972, Eisenstadt, which made uh, it unconstitutional to regulate contraception for singles. 1973, Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton on abortion. 2003, Lawrence v. Texas, um, making homosexual sodomy a constitutional right. Followed then by 2015, the Obergefell decision, uh, 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 striking down all the laws on marriage in the country and, 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 and saying that uh, homosexual marriage is, is a thing. Th these cases have further enshrined a new religion supported and protected by the federal government. This new faith has cascaded down from the federal government, the Supreme Court, the Justice Department, the Department of Education, all the way down to the public school just a mile from my house and probably just a couple of miles from here where children no longer pray or read the Bible, but instead recite new dogmas such as someone can be born into the wrong body, that girls can have penises, and that force these children to recite the lies of proper pronouns. Note that forcing children to recite proper pronouns also forces them to deny their own Christian faith, and the Jewish faith, starting with Genesis all the way through the Gospels. Consider that as late as the 1950s, fornication was illegal in, all, in, in, in at least 38 states. Adultery was illegal in all but five states. Sodomy was illegal in all the states. Even seduction was considered both a tort and a crime. And contraception was forbidden in most places. Each of these laws reflected a fundamental aspect of traditional Christian teaching. By the 1960s, um, there began to grow, because of all these court cases, a sex-centered faith that idolizes sexual pleasure, and indeed this is the birth of the new state church, something that our founders were deeply worried about. Walter Russell Mead describes this as a genuine revolution in civilization. The French author Oliver Roy considers whether the new faith of the desiring subject is what he calls it, the new faith of the desiring subject. Whatever we desire to do, we have the right and even the obligation to do. He says that this may be a current that, uh, that, the Christian, that Christian civilization may not resist. In writing uh, about my new book, Under Siege, No Finer Time to Be a Faithful Catholic, uh, John O'Sullivan said, quote, this new this new religion is an odd, syncretic blend of paganism, sexual polyversity, and scientism that does not yet have a name. Writing many years ago, Malcolm Muggeridge put it plainly when he said, the orgasm has replaced the cross as the focus of longing and the image of fulfillment. G.K. Chesterton said this was a fight of creeds masquerading as policies. He said the new hypocrite is one whose aims are really religious while he pretends that they are worldly and practical. And this is the new established church. The revolutionaries know what they are about. They come for the church and the family. Beginning most viciously with the French Revolution and continuing to our present day, the sexual left, this new church, quite properly views the church and the family as their greatest enemies. The newly established church views the family as a kind of prison where sexual pleasure goes to die, and that the church is one of the jailers in this prison. But the church and the family must change, they must become different than how God made them, and therefore they must be destroyed. I welcome this new coalition put together by Yoram Hazoni and his colleagues. He knows these things down deep. Whereas the older and dying conservative movement has been willing to allow attacks on the family, the church, and the unborn, this new movement will never sacrifice the unborn, the church, and the family for tax cuts and forever wars. And I'll just close by saying, in my new book, I talk about how there's never been a finer time to be a faithful Catholic. There's never been a finer time to be a faithful Christian. There's never been a finer time to be a faithful Jew. There's never been a finer time to be an American patriot. Why? Not because of all that, not in spite of all the problems that close in all around us, but precisely because of them. Because every single one of us is so very needed. And I think that is a remarkable thing for us to internalize. Thank you.